All right. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. You know, I love the psalmist. It's a book of songs that is found in the middle of the Bible. It's called the Psalms. And one of the psalmists writes simply this. He says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to Starbucks. No, he didn't say that. And he said, you know, let's, let's, let's go get some food. He says, no, I was glad when they said unto me, he says, let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't know what you're glad about this morning. Uh, we've got a, a beautiful family baby dedication that's going to be taking place today. We've got worship taking place. We've got uh, ministering of the word, but we've also got connecting of people one to another. There's so many things to be glad about. And, but it takes you and I turning our heart and saying, Lord, I want to be glad. I want to have gratitude. I want to just be rejoicing in the goodness of God. So why don't we stand up here this morning? And what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a time of worship. It's just time of giving our praises unto God for thanking him for all that he has done in our lives. So step in and let's worship the Lord here this morning. focus in on you, Jesus, and we want to make this all about you. So each in our hearts this morning, we want to just see your face, 
all that you mean to us personally, all that you've done for us, how faithful and good you've been in our lives. We want to zero in on that this morning, and we want to give you all the honor and glory. Let's do your name. coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you it's all about you
this morning. Be pleased, Lord, with the worship we bring you. For a moment here, we actually have a um, beautiful baby dedication at this point in time. Uh, little Emma Ann Louise Beerman, and uh, we're gonna have the family come up. And uh, there's Samantha there, and uh, Emma, and Dad Ben, come on up here. Yeah, praise the Lord. Oh, Lori, why don't you come on up and bring the bag that's uh, down there right there? Terrific. 
take Emma up in a second here. You know, it's a privilege as the family of God to be able to come together and to bless these little ones. You know, it's, I believe it's wisdom that parents would come and commit their parenthood, but also this beautiful child, their children, unto the Lord. It's scriptural. Uh, we find that Jesus, as he was making his way in the earth, that uh, parents were coming to Jesus in Mark 10 and say, would you take our children? Will you lift them up? And then will you bless them? And I believe that is the hearts of all of us, is that, Lord, bless our children. Let, put your spirit in them, put your fire in them, and just encourage them. It's interesting, the disciples, they actually thought it was trivial. But, you know, the Lord said, hold it. Suffer the little children to come unto me. He says, for the kingdom of God is of such children childlike faith so beautiful example for us here uh, today to do this and uh, again uh, I, I think it's it's great that we as a family get to be a part of this so uh, what I'm gonna do first of all though is I'm gonna ask you guys some questions and you guys as well and, and the first is this um, I'm gonna ask you do you do you believe and do you agree that this is beautiful Emma is a gift from God yes, yes. if you do say I do all right um, do you commit this day to raise this child in an atmosphere where Christ and his church are honored? If you do, say so. Yes. All right. Do you commit today to lead your child to faith in Christ at the earliest opportunity? And if, you, if so, say so. Yes. All right. Well, family, family of faith, I ask you, will you pray for and assist this family as the opportunity arises or as the Lord leads? And if so, say so. We're committed. We're a family. We're here to guard, protect, and do everything that we can. I'm going to pray for this beautiful one. Do you think she'll come to me? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you keep your eyes over there. You keep your eyes over there. No, no. You keep your eyes over there. Yeah. Um, I have a scripture here I want to read, but, Lori, it's on the piece of paper behind me. I only have so many hands, and it says this. Zephaniah 3.17, as I was thinking about her this morning, this is a scripture. The Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears, and he will rejoice over you with joyful songs. That's what the Lord wants to do for this little one. We're going to just put our hands towards her. We're going to convey a blessing unto her. Hey, yeah. Lord, we pray for this sweet Emma. Lord, we pray, oh Lord, that you would truly be her deliverer, the mighty one that saves her. Lord, would you calm her, Lord, all her fears of life. And God, would you uh, be unto her, Lord, even as a musician, songs of joy over her. Bless her, Lord. Let her live her life to the fullest to complete the purposes of God. Protect her, guide her, and let a prophetic spirit ever be in her, Lord, of worship and blessing unto you in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Yeah. I just felt this morning as I was praying, and it's interesting because Jeff and I did not talk about that scripture, but what I really had felt for Emma is joy. And I just felt that Emma is going to bring joy to her generation. There is so much hopelessness out there. People have nowhere to turn. And I just feel like the Lord is going to give her such a spirit of joy that she's going to impart hope and joy to a generation. And young kids around her will ask her, why are you so filled with joy? And that will be her witness, is the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord has filled my heart. And she will impart that joy and that hope to her peers. Amen. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Why don't we take a couple minutes and just welcome each other. Greet somebody that you don't know. We've got some family and friends here of Sam and Ben. God bless you. We have a, uh, a there's a dedication certificate in there as well as a Bible, uh, beginner's Bible. It's all in Greek. <laughs> Learn very quickly. Okay. God bless you guys. We'll get back to you guys shortly.
All right, we're going to get uh, started here right away. All right. Well, I love all the visitors. If you're first time here with us this morning, Welcome to the Pearl Church. My name is Jeff Harmon, and with my wife Lori at the front here, we are the lead pastors of this uh, wonderful church called the Pearl Church. And uh, great to have you uh, visiting. Some of you are here for the wonderful baby dedication that we had. And if you're new in the house here, well, we hope we get a chance to meet you uh, afterwards today. I uh, just want to couple, give you a couple of announcements as we make our way through here this morning. Um, I, do, I do want to put this out. Many of you know our, our sister, uh, Jamie Cox, who attends here. Uh, her, her mother, Tracy, who also has attended, uh, Tracy went to be with the Lord. And uh, she did pass away on the weekend. And uh, she did have a long battle, a number of battles, really, with cancer. But uh, um, she ultimately won the victor's crown as she has now uh, proceeded to be with her king. Uh, but we want to continue to pray for Jamie and her family, her sister, um, and continue to encourage them and just let them know that as a family we stand with them and we are here to support them. So continue to pray for her and do what you can to reach out to her. Well, as we make our way, we also want to remind you that uh, tithes and offerings are able to be presented unto the Lord. Uh, we don't have the buckets that go through uh, up and down the aisles, but uh, you can... We do use what's called the Church Center app, which allows you to do so very easily through your iPhone or iPad or uh, computer at home. Uh, you can go to our website. You can also uh, give through, uh, uh, we have tithing envelopes here that if you want to present them or you can mail them to us. So continue to give faithfully and generously. We thank you for that. Uh, our young adults are uh, continue on Thursday nights. They meet on Thursday nights. They have a group of them, and they are going through the Book of Romans. And uh, they're loving it. They're encouraged by it. So if you're new in the house, uh, if you're online and you're watching us, uh, we encourage you to come and be a part of the young adults. Find support. You're not meant to do this alone. Uh, finding new jobs and going into career paths and finishing education can be a little difficult sometimes. So we encourage you find somebody to do it with, somebody of faith. Join us on Thursday nights, and uh, it'll be posted. Information will be posted on the young adult Facebook site. And uh, just will also want to say, uh, today is also Family Conversation Day. Uh, if you're uh, visiting with us, uh, thank you for being with us. We're sort of shortening up the service a little bit just to uh, talk as a family, if those who attend our church, uh, just to talk about where we've been, where we are today, where we're going, those kind of things. It's just sort of an update Sunday, but uh, we encourage you to grab a coffee and uh, perhaps uh, on your way out, but we will be having a changeover of the service here um, at the end. So God bless you for being with us. Uh, we want to dismiss the children's ministry. If there, our kids are here, there are some. And I know Aniston is waving at her at you right now. Uh, so uh, God bless you as you make your way to it. Wow, what do we got to say? Well, we're, we're, uh, we're in a, a series called uh, The Fruit of the Spirit. I love uh, preaching about food. I love eating food. And I find if I can find scripture that talks about food, it's just working perfect. So we're, we're talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, I love coming into the house of God and being able to worship Isaiah 26, 12. The heart of the nation was simply this, Lord. Uh, we want to, uh, our, our one desire is the fame and renown of your name. Well, that's church, the fame and renown of his name. We're not here to make anybody's name great except for his name. It's not about your name, my name. It's not about first name, last name. It's simply about making the name of God great. And one of the ways we do that is we come together in worship, which we did, but we also come together and to sit underneath the word. And God, what does he want to reveal to us? What can you teach me? And I believe we need to all come with a teaching spirit where we say, Lord, what more can I learn about you and how I can walk with you? And uh, the challenge of the fruit of the Spirit in the series that we're doing is the challenge, can you walk closer, f harder with, closer with, deeper with, more intense with the Lord today than you did yesterday? And the Word of God is what helps bring us into that. By the fruit of the Spirit, it's all about taking on the character of Christ, taking on the personality, as it were, taking on the attributes of. The fruit of the Spirit are the characteristics of Christ that the Spirit of God wants to manifest in your life and my life. 
Because believe it or not, we manifest something, but usually it's not the Spirit of God. <laughs> Paul talks about this. He talks about the works of the flesh. And just like weeds in a garden, works of the flesh come up really quick. You don't even have to tend to them. You don't have to plant them. They just show up. And our flesh does that, doesn't it? Our flesh just shows up. All of a sudden, we're thinking we're doing all so good. Everything's going to be great. What a day. And then all of a sudden, we get our feet out of bed. And all of a sudden, then we, we've lost it. We stubbed our toe. And all of a sudden, words show up. And all of a sudden, attitudes happening. It's like, I thought I was going to have a great day. I was going to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And the flesh just got in the way. Well, Paul tells us that we battle against this thing called the flesh on a constant basis. And we will, until the day that we go to be with the Lord, we will be battling out some area because this flesh life has not been yet redeemed. And if anybody tells you you can live a sinless life, run. It ain't scriptural, it ain't doctrinal, it ain't what Jesus tells us. So, but I want to tell you that we can win out. There is victory to be found. And the fruit of the Spirit is part of that victory where we take on the characteristics of Christ. It's called the fruit of of Jeff. If I work hard, if I do it right, I can just sprout fruit. These fruit of the Spirit. No, you can't. It's called the fruit of the Spirit for a reason because it's spiritual. It is something beyond our earthly abilities. Galatians 5, verse 23 says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Anybody have a problem with any of those? Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. As believers, we're called to live in the Spirit. When we get born again, we come into right relationship, it all of a sudden turns into a spiritual journey. We're carrying the body of the flesh with us, but it's a spiritual journey, and we're going somewhere. And then we're pursuing God. It's a dependence on God. It's a desiring to be filled, it says, by the Spirit, that we walk by the Spirit. And we're constantly in this spiritual push towards knowing more about God with a spiritual bent to it. And then he says you've got to keep in step. You've got to keep in step with the Spirit. You know why? Because we get out of step. We get out of step easily with the Spirit. We start doing the things we think are right, the things that we want to do, the things that the world tells us to do, the culture tells us to do. And we get out of step with the Spirit. So we have to make it a conscious decision of the Spirit even to yield our lives to the things of God. The things of the Spirit are the ways of Christ. And you and I have to go after that so that we can produce the Spirit. We talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. You go back three, we did that three weeks in June if you want to know about the person of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to go listen to that. We had some great uh, look at Scripture in those areas. But today we want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And the second one we did last week was love. This week the second one is joy. Anybody here want some joy in your life? Is this world just seeming like a little joyless sometimes? It's just there's no joy to be found. And people are looking for joy and they're all the wrong places. And they're turning out not joyful but frustrated. They're turning out empty. The Bible makes it clear, joy and happiness are two different things. Joy and happiness. Today we've got this thing about the pursuit of happiness. Everybody's bent on, got to be happy. It's all about happiness, about me being happy. I, I just can't wait. You know, they, they, they wrote it into the United States, the Declaration of Independence, this thing called the pursuit of happiness. It's, it's a right. You have a right to pursue and have, be happy. No, you don't. But you can be joyful. Happiness. It's about happy and happy. You know, we've got uh, uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That, that's right. But we've gotten it all the way down to parents. You know, parents, you know, I hear it all the time. I just, I just want my kids to be happy. No, you don't. Because if they're addicted to happiness, then... They've got a problem because happiness is, bent, is based on happenings. And the happiness flees very quickly when happenings aren't so good. The pursuit of happiness is not the key to life. You know, in the first six years of our kids, it was all about happy meals. We indoctrinated them early. Because if they didn't get their happy meal, guess what? They weren't happy. <laughs> It was all about the toy and the fries and, the, and, the, and, and the, the box because the box became so many things. It was games. It was all about a happy meal. We indoctrinate them early. 
But again, the problem with happiness is it's based on happening. So when? When the events of life and the people of life and the situations of life are not going well, then I'm not happy. I'm only happy when things go the way I want them. My job goes well, I get that raise. Man, am I happy. But if I'm frustrated at that job and all of a sudden I don't get the money that I thought I should get, I'm not happy. When I lose my job, the scale of happiness just plummets. When I get married to the love of my life and everything's going so smooth and so good, no drama, no struggles, no fights, man, we're just, we're just living the life. I'm happy. But when all of a sudden there's a little friction, when all of a sudden there's a little bit of conflict going on, when I have to live the other set of the part of the vows, you know, the other part of the vows where all of a sudden it is, uh, uh, it's, it's not for better, it's for worse. <laughs> and I'm not in health, but there's a little sickness. I'm not richer, but I'm poorer. And then all of a sudden, I'm not so happy anymore. And a lot of people bail because they're driven for, I've got to find somebody that makes me happy. And all of a sudden, now life is up and down. It's like a yo-yo. You are up, you are down based on events and people, and it's like somebody else is pulling you up and throwing you down. You see, happiness is based on happiness. It means your happiness is not in your control. It's everybody else's control, and it's everybody else's fault, and it's everybody else's situation that I'm not happy. And that's not biblical. Because God wants us to have a joy that remains. See, our joy has got to be about not events, but a person. And that person is Jesus. Being dependent on him never changes. He remains the same. He's constant, so our joy can be constant. And I challenge you today to ask yourself, how's your joy? Not your happiness, how's your joy? Because if your joy is in Jesus, you are making headway into the production of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Paul writes a book simply called Philippians. It should be called the Book of Joy. Paul's writing from a jail cell. He's chained. He doesn't know what the verdict is going to be when the Romans uh, tell him whether he's going to live or he's going to die. And this isn't the first time he's had some conflict in life. Maybe you have had some conflict in life. But here, here's Paul's conflict. See if it matches up. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24, 25, he says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. That is one less than Jesus got, and he got those five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I, I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. You know what I would have learned from all this? Don't don't hang out with Paul. And then Paul goes, I've labored and toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. Ah, ouch. Food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else. I fa face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. He's a pastor. He's, he's a missionary. He, he's a Jewish Christian that all of a sudden is in great conflict and he's going through all these situations and yet he felt he was so anchored to Jesus that his joy never left him. So trusting in Jesus in the future, there's no way he could not have joy. If you were to squeeze him, if you were to press him like that sponge, the first thing that would come out of him would be joy. And Paul writes this letter to the Philippines, Philippians, Philippines too, they're included. And he writes this with joy written all over it. He says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brother, it's like, hey, finally, I got, I'm coming. To, like he's a good preacher. He, it's not his end because he's just saying, almost my end. Like finally, but I still got more to preach. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. And again, he says, rejoice. He says, let me sum it up. Let me come to the key point here. And the key point is one word, rejoice. Have some joy. It means to feel so, or to show joy. It means to rejoy. And then he says, and again, rejoy. Re, rejoy. Have joy, rejoy. Have more joy. Continue to have joy. Show joy. Philippians 4, 4, again, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's like, hey, if you're not getting this message, it's about joy. Have some joy in life. 
And Paul's writing in this, this situation of prison and beaten and chained, and, and all he comes out of him is, hey, it ain't about happiness. Because right now in my natural self, I'm not happy. I'm not happy about being chained. I'm not happy about being tortured. I'm not happy about being whipped. But I have joy. I have joy in the Lord. And he says, do it always. Not sometime, not when it feels good. Well, then I'll have joy. When I get my job, I'll have joy. When my wife, oh, my spouse, oh, my goodness, when everything is going good, then I'll have joy. No, he says, always rejoice. Always rejoice. How do we have this joy? Paul's in prison, chained 24-7. He's tied up to guards, and he's going to tell us that everybody's hearing about Jesus through all this. And all of a sudden you think, wow, this must be some super Marvel kind of guy, you know, that everything's happening. No, here, here's a man that simply had his focus right. He focused on what needed to be focused. See, joy is not found in the circumstances of a life, but the awareness of God's grace in your life. He's not weighing out the circumstances, what he's got. He's weighing out the grace of God in his life and how that is more than anything else that I could possibly have. You know, the first fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, and peace we talked about, these are for you. You will share them with others, but they're for you first. The love of God is for you first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one's like it. The law is love your neighbor as yourself. But love is first for you. And then you can love others. Well, this joy is for you. Hear me. Everyone is to have this kind of joy that Paul has. In John 15, verse 11, Jesus says this. These words I've spoken to you that my joy, my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He says, these things I've spoken to you, Jesus says, my words, my gospel, this Bible. Everything about God is revealed to us that we need to know. It's all the answers are right there, the character, the provision, the, uh, uh, the attributes of who God is and what he wants for us. He says, my words, he says, I've spoken to you that my joy might be in you, remain in you, and then your joy might be full. You see what's happening here? That out of his revelation, his joy comes into us, and then our joy is taken on, takes on his joy. His joy remains, and then our joy is full. And the key to having joy, if you haven't figured this out yet, is having Jesus as your source, not your spouse. Your spouse cannot be the source of your joy. Your children cannot be the source. You are joyful about your children, but they cannot be the source of your joy. Your job, your finances cannot be the source of your joy. Your uh, accolades in life and the degrees and the, and the titles that you get, that cannot be the source of your joy because somewhere, somehow, they'll be stripped from you, they'll be taken from you, and you will not have it left. But when your source is Jesus, your joy will remain Jesus said in John 15, 5, he says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can't have joy. You can't have love. You can't have peace. You can have facsimiles. You can have fake fruit. Have you ever gone to grocery shopping and, and you're not too sure if that's real fruit or if that's fake fruit? Is that display fruit or is that edible fruit? Because they can make some fake fruit pretty nice. And the world today has a lot of fake fruit that they tell you if you go ahead and get a hold of this through and you see it advertised on Instagram, and you see it on your Facebook, and your social media scrolls, they're, they're telling you how to get a hold of the joy that you need, and it's like, no, that is fake. It is spoiled fruit. It is rotten fruit. It won't do you any good. It comes by the fruit of the Spirit. You can't produce it without the Spirit of God. But when you abide in Him, Jesus says, if you abide in me, you can bear fruit, more fruit and much more fruit. And the key is abiding in Him, where your life becomes centered on the person of the Son of God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, that you all of a sudden pour your life into him, and he then pours his joy into you, and there is joy. There is joy overwhelming. Paul's in prison. You know, I'd like to say, hey, Paul, if you need an example of joy, right here. Just look at my life. And Paul would go, actually, you're not a very good example. And I'd have to be honest. Because I go through struggles of life just like you. Hello. 
And I sometimes don't have the joy I'm supposed to have. So you know who Paul would look like? Look at? He would look at the life of Jesus. He'd say, Jesus is my example. So here's what I want to do. Just very quickly, Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, talking about those that have gone before us, cheering us on, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily besets. And listen to this. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to just focus on these few words. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. The joy that's set before him. You know, I look at the life of Jesus, and I, I, I believe. He was a son of God, but he was a son of man. But I believe in all that, that that's in his humanity. He did not enjoy one minute in the natural of having nails driven through his hands and feet. I don't believe he enjoyed the public shame and scorn. I don't believe he enjoyed getting slapped and spit on. I don't believe he enjoyed having a cross or a crown put on his head and piercings happening where the, where the blood would come down and the piercing of his side as he hung on the cross. I don't think that he had some sort of sense of divinity that no pain bothered him because we know it did. But yet for the joy that was set before him, he endured all that. Because what he saw was the outcome of what he was going through, which was the redemption of humanity. For the joy that was set before him, that's you. That's me. You were before him. And he says, for you, I will endure this cross. And the joy is knowing that you will have a place with me in all of eternity. For that joy, he endured the cross. He lived a life of purpose. He wasn't surprised by the shame and by the suffering and the pain and the jeering because there was a joy set before him. He lived a life in alignment, in obedience, not because he enjoyed the pain, but he enjoyed knowing you would be there on the other side. For us, for you and I, it's not about the redemption of humanity. For you and I, the focus that we have to have is Jesus, simply Jesus. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, let us run the race that is marked out for us. Our joy is not what we accomplish, it's what he accomplished for us. It's his grace, it's his character. John 15, 11, remember I we already said this, that these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. How does that joy overflow in our lives? It's because we focus on who he is and what he's done for us. You don't deny the struggles of life, the pain, the sorrow, the loneliness, the difficulties of life. But that's not our focus. Our focus is on who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. You see, joy is a focus, not a feeling. For some of you, that just shook you right up. Joy is a focus, not a feeling. It's a choice of who you're focusing in on that determines the joy in your life. These things about who he is that he said, he said these things I've spoken to you about who I am, what I've done for you, and all of a sudden we get into the Word and we begin to find, look at all he's done for us. Everything else pales in comparison to who he is and what he's done. He set me free. He, he dealt with my sin. He gave me eternal life. All of a sudden, my life is different now. And our focus isn't on what we go through. It's real, but the loss, the pain, the hurt, the loneliness is nothing compared to what he's done for us. The joy of the Lord then becomes our strength. I love Lori speaking that out here this morning, one of my scriptures. Believe it or not, she does not proofread my sermons. Maybe she should, I know. But she doesn't. Nehemiah, he's talking to the congregation that has come back from captivity and they're building the temple, rebuilding the temple, and they're all complaining. They're all complaining. Many of them are complaining and weeping. They're sorrowful because the house of God isn't going to be anything like the house that Solomon built. They're complaining. They're critiquing. Anybody that wants to listen, they're, they're talking about how really it's not as like it used to be. And all of a sudden, the leadership Nehemiah, they stand up and they go, 
Stop weeping. Stop comparing. Stop looking in the natural because it isn't about what you see. It's about what God is doing. Get your focus off yourself and put it on God. He says this, for the joy of your Lord, the Lord is your strength. Not the joy of the temple isn't your strength. The joy of the building, the joy of the, how beautiful it is, the joy of how large it is. It's not that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And then Haggai comes along, this old prophet, and he begins to speak a word to Nehemiah and the leaders of Rebbebel and all the prophets or all the priests. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the prophet says this, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house, this one that you've got versus Solomon's temple. And the, says the Lord Almighty, and in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. He's saying, take your eyes off your money, off your accolades, off everything that you, the silver, the gold, everything that you are. He says, get your eyes off of you. Get your eyes off of you and get it on God. He's the one that brings the glory. This house doesn't bring the glory. This church doesn't bring the glory. God brings the glory. God brings his presence. God brings what he needs to bring into our lives. So stop with the feelings and have focus. Focus on who God is and get with the plan and build what God's building. The writer of Hebrews says that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, and I want you to hear this as we run our race. This might be something that's going to set somebody free right now. Stop running somebody else's race. You've been comparing and looking at what other people are doing, and you say, I want to be like that, and guess what? You're frustrated. You're empty. You are going through difficult, because you're running somebody else's race. Get your eyes off them and run your race. Be satisfied with what God's called you, and out of that you will find joy. Stop trying to compare relationships and people in your life and ministry and money and all these kind of things. Get off Instagram and get off social media and get your eyes on him. You'll never have joy if your focus is always on what other people have in the race they're running. Put your eyes on what God's called you to do. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, there's no room for comparison. I was a runner. I also was a bike rider. And I learned two things, both running and riding. You go where your eyes are. One time I was having a little bike ride, and I was doing a little bike ride with a friend, and all of a sudden I took my eyes off where I was supposed to go, and I saw where I shouldn't go. And my eyes led me where I shouldn't go, and I fell, and I hurt myself pretty good because I went where I shouldn't go. You know, when we are comparing with others, but we're comparing with our past, we will get in trouble. We'll end up where we shouldn't go. We start comparison, comparisons. You go, hey, you know what? If I had a spouse like that, my life would be a lot different. Hey, if I had a house like that, if I had a house like that, come on. Look, hey, if I had the stuff like they got, my life would be so much better. And then all of a sudden we put these comparisons. You know what we're doing? We're putting our eyes where it shouldn't be, and soon we get in trouble. Because we start wanting things that aren't ours. And then we fall into a situation. We all of a sudden get tripped up. We, we have a collision course with something. And all of a sudden our life becomes even more empty. Or we start comparing with the past. Oh, I remember how good it was. Can I tell you, your memory usually lies to you. Because you don't really remember all the bad things that were going on. You just think of the one good thing that comes out of that. And says, oh, if my life had that, man, oh, my life would be so much better if I was like I used to be. No, you wouldn't. But here's the point. Stop living in the yesterday and start living in the today because the joy is found in the moment, not in the past. We have to be those that pursue after and become grateful for the now and find the joy in the moment. So stop comparing yourself with the past. Let me just give you these, what Paul does to sharpen his focus. He does these things to sharpen his focus very quickly. I'm going to run through these like a, like a machine gun. Just run right through them. Number one, you find a sharpened focus when you are praying for others. Philippians 1, verse 3 and 4 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray for joy. 
Prayer itself will bring joy, but I'll tell you, you start praying for other people and you start seeing the grace of God in a different capacity that you want to bless them, you want to encourage them. All of a sudden, you realize what you've got in your life. You say, God, what you've done for me, do for them. God, begin to stir them, encourage them. You begin to pray and you begin to have intercession for them. You have a burden for them and joy comes back to you. There's a joy when you begin to pray for other people. Number two, by sharing the gospel. Paul writes in Philippians 1, verse 12 to 8, says, But I want you to know, brethren, that these things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. This whole prison and torment thing, it was the furtherance of the gospel. So that it became evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. He says, I'm not chained to these guards. My chains are in the obedience to Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Then listen to this. Some indeed preach Christ even out of envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add to my, affl my affliction to my chains. They're, they're just against me, and they're, they're actually using the gospel to get back at me. But the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, and yes, I will rejoice. C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business in heaven. Serious business in heaven. Why? Because Jesus is there and he's joy. But I believe it's also serious business in heaven because it tells us in Luke 15 that all of heaven, the angels gathered together to rejoice when there's but one that repents and comes to the Lord. There is all joy in heaven when one is converted, when one comes to re revelation of Christ. Luke 15, the shepherd leaves 99 and goes after the one. And when the one is brought back, carried back to the Lord, he says, there's joy. When 10 coins and one is lost in the house and this woman sweeps the house, brings a lamp, won't forget, I got to get the coin. And when that one is found, they have a celebration. One is found. One prodigal son, and the father broke every cultural norm to wait so he could restore that son back to sonship. You want to have full joy? Tell somebody about Jesus. Walk with them in discipleship and conversion unto Christ. Lead somebody to the Lord. Help one person that's lost be found. Tell your story. Engage with somebody that is broken, that is down on their luck, and walk alongside of them and help them financially and encourage them somehow, this distraught soul, to find peace. You want to find joy? Get one in your life. Find a one. Who's the one that you are pursuing, praying for, going after? And maybe you just need to bring them to church. Let them sit beside you. Number three, simply be all in. Be all in. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 and then 7 to 8. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Good teachers repeat things. Let me just tell you that again. Good teachers repeat things. And he says, but what things were gained to me, these things I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them so as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Then he goes on, he says, that I might be found in him, that I might know him, be conformed to him, I be attained to the resurrection of the dead. Can I tell you what Paul is saying? He says, I'm not doing this halfway. I'm giving it all up. I'm all in. I'm not holding back half my chips and I'm just bending a little bit. He says, no, I'm pushing it all in. I'm all in for Christ. I'm, I'm giving it all in. And you will be full of joy when you're all in. When it comes to the things of the Lord and what he's doing in the earth, life's journey becomes joyful when all of a sudden he is first. But he is all that you want. Keep your eyes on Jesus, what he's doing, what he's done for you. Listen, Everything in this life that you're trying to accomplish and attain in life pales in comparison to what Jesus can give you in the here and the now. You will find joy when you live your life all in. And can I just tell you this? Because I've learned this. If you're living halfway, only half in, one foot in, you'll be frustrated not only with the kingdom of God but with the kingdom of this world. 
You'll never be fully satisfied. You'll never find the joy until you're all in. Lastly, simply by being generous. Praying for others. You need to be those that are not just praying for others, but you need to be those that are being all in. You need to be sharing the gospel. Lastly, by being generous. Paul commends the church of Philippi for their care for him, sharing in his distress, and, and then giving finances. And he says to them to this. I'll read it to you, and then I'll come to the sentence. Philippians 4.10 and then verse 14 on, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. They were wanting opportunity, but they, they just wasn't there, but they wanted to. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, an area where the Philippi is, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now listen to this. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities, not that I seek the gift of finances, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Paul was grateful for the financial blessing, but he was more excited that fruit would abound to their account. That word abound is a money market uh, uh, term talks about interest. You put down $100 and you got interest. You get something coming back. You give and something comes back. That's what that abound means. And they received in their spiritual account that when they gave, something came back to them, fruit. And I believe that would also be fruit of joy. There is joy that comes when you're generous to others. Sociologists, psychologists, there are so many studies that have been presented that when people are generous givers, when they're willing to give out to other people, they, they find contentment. There's joy that comes back to them. They're only knowing what the Bible's already presented to us. Paul said this when he was showing his life of hard labor and giving to others, meeting the needs of the weak. He says in Acts 20, verse 35, in everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work. Here's his example that we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. You are more fortunate, more blessed, favor, happy, envied when you give than when you receive. And I think every one of us can testify to this when all of a sudden you've had opportunity. When you've had an opportunity, we were just at the A&W the other day, my wife and I, and we're ready to get our burgers and just go on to do our business, and a young man comes by on a bike, and he says, hey, can, can you buy us a burger? Yeah, sure, we'll buy Meet me on the other side. We go through, and we buy a burger for him. He wanted a mama burger. We, we upscaled him. We got him a papa burger. <laughs> Not, hey, we're going to bless the man. We're going to give him double. All right, good. So we get to the other side and hand it over to him, and it's real quick. Hey, thanks, man. And off he goes riding his bike, and you know, it's easy. We could have said, I wonder if we're like the third or fourth person that he got a burger out of. You know, it could have been easy all of a sudden to judge him. Is he worthy for me to give? But instead we gave, and it was like, hey, that felt good. I didn't do it for any other reason, you know, not because I needed to do anything. It's just, it just felt good to do it. It is more blessed to give than to receive the key being generous is it about our finances no yes it's about our serving it's about our spirit of generosity it's about our hand being open instead of closed it's about lord being able to put into your hands and freely give it out where your treasure is there will be your heart also the key to joy is your focus, not feelings. You don't deny it, but you go through it with a focus, focus on Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is, starts off love, joy, peace. Joy is the one we're dealing with right now. Joy is spelled J-O-Y. Let me just give you this, tuck this in somewhere. Joy is spelled J for Jesus, O for others, and Y for you. And when you flip it around, it goes yop. What does that mean? I don't know. 
But it does make sense. Biblically, it makes sense when Jesus is first, then others, and then you. The joy. God wants us to have joy. Not just a little joy. He says that my joy might be in you and remain. And then it says, then it says, and that your joy might be full, overfilled. And that's my prayer for you. Take these four areas, sharpen your focus, sharpen your focus by, by being those that are praying for others, you're generous for others, you're, you're uh, uh, constantly being uh, those that are willing to be all in, and then finally you're also uh, those that are willing to share the gospel. Simple. Sharpen your focus. We're going to close up the service here. We're going to have the team come up. We're going to sing a song, and we're going to worship the Lord and thank Him for the joy. I want to encourage you, focusing on Jesus brings gratitude because you cannot outgive Him. He's given you way more than you could possibly give back to him. Focus on him, what he's done for your life. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know how the struggles are. I don't know the difficulties. I don't know the loneliness. I don't know the... But what I do know is because Jesus never changes, your joy can remain and your joy can be full. Let's stand up here. We're going to pray. Can we do the number one song? Can you do the number one song? What are we going to do? Lord, we ask, Lord, that today you would help us sharpen our focus. God, if we've been putting our eyes on our past or we're putting our eyes on other people, help us take our eyes off those things and put it on you. God, we're living in a life, Lord, where people are telling us how to be happy. But, Lord, we don't want to be happy. We want to be joyful. Happiness is about happenings, but joy is about Jesus. So, Lord, we pray today. Would you overwhelm us with this sense of desire to focus on Jesus in our marriages, in our homes, in our families? Focus on Jesus when it comes to our jobs and our finances. We'd focus on Jesus when it comes to our health and our struggles in our natural body. We don't deny what goes on, but we just put our eyes on you. And if anyone here does not know Jesus Christ, it is simply an invitation to say, Lord, I don't want to be in control of my life anymore. I make a mess of it. Lord, it's called sin, and I need my sin dealt with, my disobedience. Lord, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you come in and guide my life? Would you live in me that I might live for you? Yield my life to you, Lord, and because of that, I know the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in me and that I can then bear the fruit that you desire. Lord, be with us today as we give our lives to you afresh in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, let's worship the Lord here.
for your presence here today. We go out and choose joy today. Amen. Amen. You know, this is, uh, we're just going to hold it all together here for before we break up here. You know, uh, we've got a beautiful family. Just had a baby born too. And uh, uh, Kenna and Annabelle uh, and their family were going to come. And um, we've missed seeing them. They're great. I'm great to have them with us here. And uh, they just asked if we could pray for them, and they want to dedicate this family unto the Lord. Or Annabelle, <laughs> Kenny, or Annabelle. Yeah. Um, a beautiful family that we've just enjoyed. Um, many of us have come alongside them. We just want to bless them and encourage them. And, and uh, I know it's impromptu, but you know what? I love what the Lord wants to do here. <laughs> little girl this is you, you got a few of them hanging on you here <laughs> and a little young man here what a family we want to bless his family little uh we're gonna go by annabelle that's her uh, second name kenny um yeah we want to bless his family let's stretch our hands out towards his family here god we're so thankful and so grateful lord that you knit us in together lord you take us from so many different places of life and you bring us to be a family Lord, I thank you that the Pearl Church can be a family. And Lord, we pray for this young one, Lord. Kenny Annabelle, Lord, that you would just bless her, strengthen her. Lord, let the Spirit of the Lord rest upon her. Lord, that she would be such a voice. So God, even as we heard before to this generation, but Lord, let there be a, a spirit upon her, Lord, to break and turn back all spirit of darkness, every cloud of heaviness. Lord, every suffering, oh Lord, there would be in her justice. There would be in her righteousness and godliness. So Lord, we pray a blessing over this home in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let me ask you, parents, do you receive her as a gift from God? Yes. Do you believe that it's your call to nurture, to train, to guide them in the ways of, of Christ? to honor the church and the ways of the Lord? And will you do everything possible to raise them to love Christ and to love his ways at the earliest possible time? Amen. Lord, we bless his family. We bless mom and dad. We bless brother and sisters, Lord, that this family would be a house for you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, we are going to end right here, and there's coffee over there. Um, and then in a few minutes here, we're going to come back. For those that are part of the church here, part of the family, we encourage you to stay. We want to talk with you just about, again about where we were, where we are, where we're going, those kind of things. And those that are visitors, thank you so much for joining us and being part of this day. And, uh, but I encourage everybody else to stay, and we'll get to started right away here shortly.